All right, coming to you live from Alameda, California, by way of San Francisco and the airwaves. Ladies and gentlemen, keep it going for Ralph Zig Tycho. Hey, good morning, Paulie. Good morning, How sir. How are you? Good morning, sir. How are you? Before we go any further, introduce uh, the guest, please. <laughs> All right, we have uh, joining us today, and of course, I'm on the right, wrong camera. There we go. Joining us today. Uh, from San Francisco also uh, is uh, Brooke Larson. She's a linguist and also our neighbor here in the, <laughs> yeah. in, in the, in the, in the dark, deep recesses of the Odd Fellows building. Yeah, fellow dungeon mate. Fel fellow dungeon mate. There yeah. you go. Good to have you here. Thank I'm glad you. that you got away from your shackles for just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, thanks. For, so, so thanks for joining us in the zone with Zig. What's oh. happening, Ziggy? Well, I understand you're from Everett, California, Everett, Washington. Washington. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Proud Evertonian. <laughs> Good. Um, I have very happy memories in Everett, Washington. Oh, you've been there. Uh, I was the Topps baseball card representative for a number of years. And um, one of my stops was to see the. Everett Giants, yeah. run by run by Buzzy Vavasi's kid. Yeah. I can't remember which of the brothers, but um, he disliked me considerably. But <laughs> um, that I remember. Um, <laughs> and um, but I got to sign the players that were first year minor league players in the um in the organization to their tops contract oh, cool. and um so when they reached the big leagues tops had the permission to use their picture on cards and likenesses and i got to give each player a five dollar contract signing fee which <laughs> uh, players considered that what they called stake money now it would be hamburger money, but um, and not even in San Francisco. Yeah, right. uh, no, money. no, in San Francisco it costs you more than five dollars to get into San Francisco <laughs> these days. Am I correct? That is We're correct. Told, uh, and what I believe it's seven. Right. Well, Everett, um, Everett was the uh, second northest place I visited on. Um, my yearly excursion, Bellingham, Washington, close to the border, was second. Um, can you tell me something about your experience, Brooke, in growing up in, um, in Everett that was unusual or memorable? Um, Give me a taste of being in Everett, if you would. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Everett. Like I said, I think it was Bill Bavese who owned the the Giants back in the day. I remember going there as a kid. Uh, yeah. Everett, I mean, is the northernmost uh, town over 100,000 in the contiguous United States. So when I was growing up, what I thought was extremely normal was just darkness uh, for a lot of the year, uh, say in the winter getting up going to sleep in the dark uh and only upon you know moving out and down south uh did i realize that's pretty uncommon so i'd say that's the most notable thing from growing up there you know uh, what did you do to establish an identity in a small town i went to seattle <laughs> i left i, I guess <laughs> yeah no. yeah i guess i left uh, uh, that's the best way to do it yeah. um they talk about you anyway so uh yeah, yeah. seattle all it does all, the, all it does is rain anyway so people have the the weather to talk about seattle is great on some some level oh, yeah. um do you miss washington uh living in california and what do you miss and what do you like about being in california well, you didn't realize you were going to have to do an oral book no, report, I, did you? No, I'm hyped for this. Because I'm a, 
like again, I'm stifling well, we'd like all to get my, to like, know her, Paulie. Right? No, I'm I'm just I'm just saying. I I know we 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 do, we don't get out much, and it's on a Tuesday, <laughs> and we really go all out. So I'm well, sorry. Okay, yeah, well. like, I mean, so when I moved down here, I thought I was only going to move down for a year. I was like, oh, I need a job. There's Brooke, no we're going Brooke, we have a real interviewer coming in and Paulie <laughs> for ne- next. So all I can do is babble and admire um, anybody who makes a move. Yeah. Uh, be it north, south, east, or west. Um, because I made a move from New York and I thought it took a lot of guts. Establishing roots somewhere else, and uh, looking for where you want to be. Yeah, um, I, I admire. I admire you. What do you like about San Francisco? And I'll turn it over to Paulie. I mean, I like. I moved down here in September, and there are still flowers blooming. You know, just the hills and all the stereotypical beauty that you get here. I really love that. But I miss. I miss the the moss. I need some gloom and darkness and moss which you just can't find around here you know like, well I, um you fit in so well with the other women in my life in terms <laughs> of, of seeking dark, darkness i don't know yeah, yeah. i guess it's when i find them that they seek the darkness <laughs> um, <laughs> but um i'm used to it don't, better don't than seeking a shelter yeah <laughs> that's right what, that's what i say <laughs> um no, but I mean, yeah, okay, but but we're coming up on the, the gloomy season. We're coming up on October. Do you like Halloween? Do oh, you celebrate? 100%. I love it. Like, I really love people just getting out in the streets and interacting with strangers and being weird. I think right. more holidays should do that. Yeah, and it's it's actually, even though it seems like every year they were celebrating it, even in the beginning oh, of God, September yeah. or end of August, people were decorating for for october already and i'm like really i think it's a little ridiculous it's a little ridiculous yeah. and then i don't fall into the trap that i used to which is buying candy that i'll actually eat uh yeah the- <laughs> and then i never buy it before the month of october and i definitely don't buy it you know right. I, I buy it right up i'll buy it like a week before yeah Right at the peak of the price. Right at yeah. the peak of the price. Yeah, no, wouldn't want any deals or anything <laughs> yeah. or half price the day after. And then, um, and then, yeah, the last it was like two years ago. We had like a couple hundred kids come to wow. our house, Damn. and so we ran out of candy like twice. Yeah. Wow. And so we're like, okay, we're gonna do it right. And so we got the big old <laughs> trash bag full of whatever <laughs> can of candy from Costco or whatever it was, and I think we saw twenty kids. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> So we have enough candy to last us the next couple of years, but it's all candy that nobody will eat. Yeah. It's like uh, jawbreakers that look like eyeballs. Oh, dang. Yeah. That's not the like Reese's that. Pieces cups or whatever. No, but... no, because those, those would be gone yeah, or they would yeah. be thrown into a milkshake or yeah, something, right? Yeah. right? Um, but yeah, so I, I, that's that's really the reason I love Halloween is chocolate season. I mean, candy. I mean, it, it's yeah. the kids. No, oh. wait, that's wrong, too. That sounds creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, I see you're hanging out with a buddy there. You got a little friend on your shoulder. It's kind of like your parrot. Oh, uh, his name is Cleon, and uh, named after Cleon Jones. And he's one of the little guys I've been carrying around with me for 25 years. I'll just stick it to Cleon this time, but I'm going to introduce in future shows. Not to get your hopes up too high, um, George S. Oh, for George, George Steinbrenner. Thomas <laughs> Peter. Oh, so, um, but these guys bring me good luck wherever I go, and um, there you go. So, how's the weather over there in Alabama? Absolutely. After a week of fall-like weather. Alameda has been absolutely gorgeous in the last few days. It's gorgeous. The weather is gorgeous. <laughs> so anybody considering a visit to California, Alameda in particular, uh, now is the time. They call it Indian summer because technically it is, uh, it's autumn. Well, there you uh, go. 
because uh, making it sound calling it native american yeah. summer just sounds silly that's why i thought but anyway right exactly <laughs> and it's that offensive to indian folks well what um, were they said somebody was trying to tell me no that's not their proper name either and i'm like yeah i'm done yeah i just give up I just, i'm done <laughs> just like whatever whatever you want to call yourself yeah, yeah. Uh, how about uh, if i just call you sir thanks for the weed well, and then now I'm I'm calling people that are. So I'm using the term "dude" as a catch-all yeah, yeah. for for every sex, gender classification. Even my mom, um, I'm like, "What's up, dude?" Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> at this point, hey, this is this is my wheelhouse it's, as a linguist. It's right? less of yes, Let's go to the linguist. Let's go to the professional. And I think that's hundred percent legitimate. Like. Words change their meanings. Like girl used to just mean any little kid. Well, even he was just he was just sounded like a, I, I was gonna say it. I, I, he sounded like when he was saying what the weather was like. He, he sounded like a, a Jewish goyle. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'm proud to sound that way. Proud to bring up the voices. I was gonna say calling someone dude is less offensive than calling them Skippy. <laughs> Yeah. Right. No, I, I'm serious. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's kind of it is the catch all. I mean, it seems like you guys, you know, you, you guys. guys. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're yeah. saying it's they're... not like I'm saying they're male or yeah. female yeah. or whatever. It, it just means you people, you know, that, <laughs> you know, say. I've heard dude refer to with women quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. They'll yeah. talk to each other. Come on, dude. Yeah. Even amongst um, ourselves. Like it's. I want to get a shirt that says preferred pronoun X and O. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. And so I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Or an X Y yeah. or just, I identify as a sperm. <laughs> it's like a little yeah, sperm. It's like a little. Yeah. A little egg with a little <laughs> tail on it. And... <laughs> Brooke, what do you do for fun? For fun? Yeah. I don't have any fun. No, actually I go to Alameda. I, the pinball museum. I love the pinball. The museum. pinball museum. Dude, it's so cool. I've been oh, there. I've been, oh, it's been there many times. Yeah. We'll have to meet and have a cup of coffee and uh, take a walk and you can come down by the shore. Yeah, I've gone bowling at the Bolero there. There's a, a so okay. Wait, hold on. Is Bolero the fancy one? Yeah, I, I don't like. Yeah, that. you say. Ah. But it is. I love. Bowling. You sold out. Yeah, I, I I love bowling too. So I go to bowling league on Thursdays, and so we have a Bolero out in the valley in Manteca, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna bring during the summer break. I was like, I'm gonna bring my ball home so that I can go bowling at the local bowling alley. And I'm like, oh, it's a bolero, a bolero, and it's gonna have you know all this fancy stuff. Yeah. But you can just go bowling. Yeah. You can't just go bowling. Oh, I, I, I miss the like fluorescent lights, the old people smoking. I like miss that sort of regular bad carpet, bright right. bowling alley. Yeah, know? it should smell like stale beer yeah, and 100%. cigarettes, right? I, and yeah. so I literally, it, it, so I think it was, I think they wanted me to pay 25 bucks for I know, it's just a like couple shocking. games. It's ridiculous. And yeah. I was like, wait, hold on. What what are you doing? And it's uh, it's all lights and... Yeah. Yeah. Used to you know, like that description like of bowling alleys made me want for the one in Concord. Mm. Um, I used to teach traffic school and that was a venue for a long time. And... Um, it smelled like hell. Uh, you got stale beer and uh, stale people, <laughs> but um, I miss it. Yeah. I miss it. Sundays in Concord, teaching traffic school at Pizza Traffic School, huh. and um, no one enjoyed being there except me because it was Sunday. And I was going to be off the next day. And um, I was getting paid for it all. And I got to meet a lot of people. And that was a good gig. Have you seen, um, this, have you seen this bowling alley across from the park? It's called Lucky Strike. Oh, yeah. Dude, it's too... Again, no. expensive, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's, just, it's all dark and glitzy and, like, there's a good one in Daly City. There's a, it's 50 lanes. It's huge. And it's just... And it's plain. regular bowling. It's just straight up plain. regular bowling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You Great can't, you can't do anything Lucky like that strike. anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Go ahead. 
No, I was saying great name, Lucky Strikes. Yeah, Lucky Strike is pretty cool, and it's and it's retro looking and it's neat looking. But uh, I think the one time I went there, I ended up going there for a party, and it was like, oh, okay, I wouldn't mind going bowling, but they weren't bowling; they just did it for the 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 locale. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, and I forget. I think I looked at the price of bowling then, and it was crazy. Yeah. Um, hey, Paulie, we're both smokers. Um, of the cannabis variety. I'm just curious because we haven't seen each other in a week. What are you smoking this week? Um, just got a new flavor to savor and I can't remember what it is. The other one I've been smoking on is, um, white thorn rose by Huckleberry Hill farms. And I see you're holding up a warning for our audience. Ladies no, and I'm, this is a I'm warning. holding this is up. A oh, here it is. What I'm smoking, which is oh, called glass, um, glass House Farms. Okay. Yeah, Glass House Farms Gush Mints. Oh, yeah, and, those are tasty. Uh, I simply cannot recommend cannabis enough to my <laughs> fellow humans. <laughs> and I wanted to talk, I sent a, a picture. I wanted to talk about cannabis that that was um, not for smoking. And I want to ask the rhetorical question <laughs> okay. because it could help build your house, um, cut down, stopping and cutting down trees and what have you, uh, cotton fabric without uh, the bull weevil. It's the the high notwithstanding it's two different plants hemp i'm talking about what in the hell stops hemp from being legal in this country even if you don't want to get high god forbid you should change your consciousness and the stat of the other thing but um because there's still a percentage of thc in hemp if they could extract, it's kind of like, uh, 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 what is it? Decaffeinated coffee. It, decaf yeah. isn't void of any caffeine. It just has very, very, very little. And so same thing with hemp. There is THC in hemp, but you would have to smoke a football field of it. And you would probably, you would definitely get a headache before you would get high. <laughs> And, and you would be uh, buying no, it to build the me, house. Somebody handed me a joint the other night and said, oh, this is for you. And they show me a pack of cigarettes. And it's, I want to call it Cosmic Panda. And they were called Hemp Rockets. And what it was is, it was hemp rolled up, non-psychoactive, just for the flavor. But then they put THCA in it to get you high. And I'm like, I'm really confused. Why would you? It's like getting oregano and <laughs> yeah. and lacing oregano or something. It's like, wait, w are you just doing it for the flavor? Well, I, I is it just for the act of doing it? Because it's not, it's not going to be less expensive. Or no, less in a way, it might even be yeah. more expensive because of the THCA. It, it, that stuff's like a. You can buy that. It's like $50 a gram because that's like almost 100% THC. When you smoke that, that's the crack of marijuana. That well, THCA it sounds like a like bunch of stuff, a bunch of well-educated chemists with nothing on their, their minds. And uh, I've already been smoking dope. Well, they wouldn't have thought uh, of that. Um, anyway, I got my... Uh, my can of talk today. Your can of talking. Yes. You do. So I feel better. And I got to spend some time with you, Paulie B. Yes. Sir. And um, meeting Brooke was on on uh, face to face on on um, this podcast and having you a part of it was really a pleasure. And um, we got a good second half coming up. We're going to um, interview. We already have the interview in the can, and Paulie will get it in with Larry Schechter, who wrote a very compelling book, 
the history of fantasy sports. And after all, um, I uh, I stand by sports is is great. It's been a big pastime for me, and uh, especially baseball. And having my memories, having being able to go back in memory land with this podcast has been tr- tremendous. So thank you, Paulie B. No and, problem. Uh, um, we're gonna do your we're gonna do your shout out now, so I don't forget about uh, about Dennis. Let's kind of do that right now with you. Um, I, that'd be great because um, I have for the past three weeks been almost a different person because my big worry is not my health failing, seventy seven years old, but the state of my vehicle. Especially, it's my abode for the most part, and it's the motor, um, the motor, um, what do we call it? The, what do we call it, Paulie? It's the motor, um, <laughs> I, yeah, give me another hit. What happened so, to your vehicle, because what happened to your vehicle is the overflow for your radiator went out. Right. Well, I needed a, I needed someone because I couldn't drive it to the a shop. I needed someone who qualified under Yelp standards, and I did some research, and who made mobile diagnosis and would fix anything. Minor couldn't put fluids in, or you know couldn't do it by the law, but so um, out comes Dennis, and uh, we hit it off right away. He made me feel like everything's going to be fine, which is the first step a mechanic needs to go through to assure his, his, um, his client that not to worry it's like having a baby you worry about your kid and um so we worked things out and lo and behold this guy liked what we do here and wanted to advertise on our show so we are giving him um as much time as as possible on a weekly basis um kind of as a, a trade-off uh, for me to be assured that if my um, BMW, which sounds great, but it's a difficult car to work on and expensive to work on. So um, I pay the parts, he, he pays the labor, and we give him the, um, the word out there, the shout out on a weekly basis that he so richly deserves because um, I went out to his shop with the car and watched he and his crew work hand in hand and make the five or six people that came in all had different needs, all needed talking to, and I watched the way they related as humans to um, to their customers, so that if you are need a, a mobile mechanic or need a mechanic you can trust, what's the number? All right, check out D1 Mobile Auto Service. That's right, D1 Mobile Auto Service at 510-978-7064. That's the number again. It's 510-978-7064. Check out D1 Mobile Auto Service, and you can check them out on the web at d-1mobileautoservice.com. They do everything from engine assembly, transmission, clutch kits, suspensions, diagnostic, water pumps, you name it. Check out Dennis and his crew, D1 Mobile Auto Service, 510-978-7064. And Dennis runs a wonderful 
not a show, a wonderful shop <laughs> where, first of all, it's clean as a whistle. And second of all, the people he has working with him work as a team. And there's no ego involved. Everybody is doing something different. Everybody contributes to every job in one way or another. So, I mean, as checkout, as what have you. Uh, and it has contributed to my getting to the point where I'm comfortable in my, in my skin on a daily basis, not worrying about one less thing to worry about. How about that? There so, you go. All right, All so right. check out one less thing to worry about with D1 Mobile Auto uh -huh. Service Repair. Uh, hey, I, I, I'm less. thinking of you were talking. You gotta about worry less as an old person, or it'll consume you because there's enough out there to worry about that I don't need to add um, a vehicle. Uh, um, to my worries. No, no, not at all. So, and uh, I want to give a shout out to my friends over um, that do this great product. Um, check it out. Um, I, I'm looking to see if they actually have a different name on it than what I'm looking for. Uh, okay. Are you looking St for Staligi? It's Staligi Confections in Oakland. Uh, they make a chocolate bar. This is not oh. a chocolate bar for the um, for kids at like all. Halloween. No, yeah, this, don't <laughs> hand this out at Halloween, folks. Uh, this is from uh, this is called the Psyche Mushroom Infused Chocolate Bar. Wow. So each one of these little squares is a half gram of mushrooms, oh, yeah. magic mushrooms. Oh wow! And uh, so, the trouble with mushrooms historically <laughs> is it's been so difficult to ingest. And this sounds like um, no, it's, it'd be not, great. It's, it's not hard this way. Matter of fact, oh. you got to really watch your dose this way. So yeah, um, so we Staligi 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 Confections in Oakland, California. We'll hear more about them. I, I've already done my own little review of the product, and yes, <laughs> two Beautiful. thumbs up for me alone. Um, hey, I'd like to offer my condolences to those who have rooted you included paulie for the oakland days for these many years they are officially uh done in oakland yeah and, and brooke is actually wearing her last dive bar yeah. in oakland oakland coliseum shirt if you can see it i went i went to the game last uh, friday you went to the last game was that the last stand? no no but it was fourth it's like one of the last games it's one of the last games yeah i so want to go but man that's tough that that's breaking my heart yeah. you know yeah. we talked about we've talked about it many times ralph uh there's hey, it was 1968 and i was in the service at travis and uh, a, naturally a giant sympathizer because they had been the new york giants an apologist, let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, the A's came out. It was a, a totally different world with the uniforms and the, the mustaches and the spirit of the East Bay. And to watch a game in the East Bay as opposed to um, the coldness, the bitterness of candlestick was great. And... Um, so I took to them immediately, didn't give up on the Giants and naturally the Mets, but uh, many, many memories there. Uh, we've had Nancy Finley among uh, uh, Carl Finley's daughter and uh, Charlie Finley's kin as a guest. She um, worked and came out here when the, the A's moved from Kansas City. And uh, she's been a tremendous guest over the years. She's heartbroken. Um, but uh, what can I tell you? 
Yeah, and we've had we've had out. other we've had ace players like even Mike, right? Mike's Mike was on the A's. We've had a few yeah. A's. Mike Heath was a, a, an A's coach, and um, it's just uh, the living in the East Bay. It's family. I run into people who are avid A's fans and who are in real mourning, and that brings to mind my 11-year-old experience um, when the New York Giants moved, and I hadn't even turned 11 yet, and um, it broke my heart as a kid, and, and there are things you never get over. And I think, I'm going to throw my two cents about eminent domain, it's too late for the A's, but... Uh, these cities should not be allowed and baseball should not be allowed to win the hearts of kids and old folks and, and then, then, steal, and then steal them and dro drop them same thing happened with my seattle sonics you know i was a giant sonics fan and then they did basically the exact same thing took them to some <laughs> Oklahoma City, right? And it, and it's and it's a money thing. It's yeah, never I'm because saying. it's the best thing for the fans or yeah. the players or whatever. It's it's a money thing. It's always where the they're going where the money is. Right. Absolutely. And they used to say it's baseball is a business all the time. I've always known it, but I really it hasn't hit home yet that how big a business it's become. And how important the money is and the greed between the Players Association and the, um, the owners the, um, to make it bad news to the fans in every way. And Ziggs, so, uh, say goodbye to Brooke because we're going to close this segment anyway. But say right. hi. Say goodbye to both of us <laughs> and great, you're yeah. going to handle it. Yeah, she um, has to get to work. We're doing what we do. Um, absolutely. Thank you, uh, for joining us. Appreciate it. Reminds me of Maynard G. Krebs. My mother used to call me Maynard because work was work. <laughs> and I wasn't good at it and I knew it. Um, but for all the people out there who choose to find an alternative to work, and that could be work that you have a passion for, doesn't become work. So uh, Paulie's a good example. I'm a good example. Um, your work should be a passion. Absolutely. And that, that, that's my word. Um, my word for today. From uh, I'm close to the Boyd Sanctuary in Oakland or in Alameda, Brooke. So uh, give me a ring and come down and we'll walk, the, we'll walk um, South Shore. You got it. She just gave you a thumbs up. She's out the door. Um, but what else do you want to talk about, Zig, before we go into this thing about Larry? Um, I just want to tell you again, and I, I say this on a repeated basis, how easy it is for you to work with, for me to work with you, and how if anybody out there who has uh, – been guests or, uh, on my show or hasn't been guests and they wish to get the word out in any way. Edge Studios and Paul Brumbach. Paul Brumbach is uh, the fellow to, to talk to. Um, he will, like my mechanic, treat everybody as individuals. And uh, so um, uh, let me know if you need an in intro, um, but uh, if you just went to him and told him who you are and uh, what you need, what you wanted to do, be it your own podcast or video documentaries, paying homage to your family or homage to the times you lived in, we could do it all. Uh, I consider myself part of Edge Studios, so I can say we, and uh, I'm privileged. Thank you, Paul. 
Thank you, Zig. And, and you're right. It's that easy. If you, if you, that is true. If you, if it's that easy, if you actually have an idea or something you want to accomplish, where you can help you here. So reach out to us at Ed Studios Online at gmail.com. That's Edge Studios Online at gmail.com. Or reach out to us on all social media, including the one that's right below me here, uh, Edge underscore Studios underscore Online at Instagram, Facebook, and you name it, we're there. Um, I enjoy doing this and I love helping people create. So if that's you, let us know how we can help. Yeah. And I just want to say how much easier life is if one has a dream, whatever it is. Right. And uh, keep that dream going. Keep it alive. And if it's not working for you, find another dream. <laughs> but don't, give, don't give up and uh, keep trying. And uh, life is much easier that way. That's right. I, I like to say, chase your dreams. But if your dream right. is a wet one, don't slip and fall. Keep your humor, humor dry and your dreams wet. And, uh, I've, I've lived by that for a long time. I'm a hedonist. Nothing wrong with that. Um, live life the way it should be lived. Look for the simple pleasures and those that answer something. Bye, everybody. All right. We'll see you next week, Zig. See you, Paulie. All right. So we're going to throw this over to uh, the Larry Schechter interview. Here we go, folks. Uh, hope you enjoy. Coming to you live from San Francisco, California, it's time for Ralph, Zig, Tycho, and Zig in the zone. I am in the zone to keep your pacing going. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep that energy going, Mr. Oh, Zig? my God. It, it's a strain. Let me tell you something, Paul. Um, I'm so glad your back is feeling better. Me too. After all these weeks. Um, Tell me what preceded that or what? Uh, I, you know, it just, it, it, I literally woke up wrong. We're at this age that you can cough and blow out a, you know, a rib or something at this point. And so, it, yeah, it, it was literally, I woke up wrong and had a bad back for like five or six days. And it was, a, it, it was excruciating. If you look at last week's show, you can actually see me wincing at different parts. And so I'm like, oh, oh I'm going to grab my back. So it's good to be back here. Thank you. Um, we have a special episode of Zig in the Zone today. Well, we certainly do, because one of my favorite topics in the whole world is um, my experiences with Roto Ball. Now they call it Fantasy Ball. Okay. And, uh, or Fantasy Sports. And my guest is Larry Schechter, who wrote a book about just that. And you're calling from upstate in New York? No, it's actually, he's... He, oh, oh, he's in Bo Boca Raton. No, he's from Boca Raton, but he's calling from upstate New York, correct? We Not got that. Larry Schechter, which is actually the author of the history of fantasy sports and the stories of the people who made it happen. Uh, Larry Good to have you along on the zone. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, good. Good to be here. And, Let me clear uh, it up. Where were you <laughs> calling from? I'm, I'm from upstate New York. I moved to Boca Raton, Florida about eight years ago. That's where I am now. Oh, okay. Then um, I guess I win that one. You do win that one. All right. Okay. All right. Hey, welcome. First time on our airwaves. and. Um, I hope you're comfortable because we love having you. I'm comfortable for now. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I bright in Zig. What part of upstate New York are you from? Because I'm from Queens in the city. I'm from Schenectady, okay. which is up near Albany. And so it was confusing being a kid learning how to write and read, spell my name. I'm 
Larry Schechter, S-C-H-E-C, from Schenectady, S-C-H-E-N. That was kind of confusing. Well, I'm from New York, and it was confusing for me. So I can imagine, uh, uh, actually, I'm from Queens, uh, where I took my um, degree in daydreaming at PS1. (laughs) At PS 148. They gave you that special cone hat. It said dunce on the end, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they gave it to me to keep. They gave it to you to keep. <laughs> Not just for the day. Larry, um, what about Schenectady? Because I've never been there and I've never known anybody from there. Um, what about Schenectady is special? Um, nothing really. Okay. Um, it used to be, it used to be a big general electric town. GE used to be the, the biggest employer by far, but it's not as big anymore. They're still there, but not as big anymore. And what did you grow up having as your passion? I always liked sports. Okay. Um, and golf, golf, you know, uh, watching professional sports playing board games like Stratomatic baseball and football, um, playing golf. Those were my passions. I still, you know, I've always played golf and my, uh, you know, my board game baseball turned into fantasy baseball when I heard about that by the time I was, I was like about 32 or 33 by the time I first heard about fantasy baseball and fantasy football. Now, uh, if you had a preference, would it be football or baseball? I like both of them. Okay. Right on the, on the, the fence there about that. Um, what did you do for, or what would have you done as your passion if it weren't for sports? I never thought about that. Okay. Um, Take you know, I used, to play, I, used, I used to play the piano when I was a teenager. Haven't done that anymore in a, in a long time. Okay. And what brought you to Boca Raton? How did you um, decide to move from there, from Schenectady? Um, just a change of lifestyle, warm weather, no taxes. You know, I was never, I was never a winter person. I, I don't ski. You know, there's nothing I like to do in the winter. So, um, you know, it made sense and uh, glad to be here. Okay. Are you at Kings Point in in Boca Raton? Uh, I know where Kings Point is. Um, Technically, that's in Delray, which is like the next suburb up from Boca. Oh, okay. Delray, you're right. Absolutely, you would know. Uh, What about Boca? Um, is different than the other cities in Florida that is especially appealing. Yeah, what trapped you, Larry? What got you there? What What was it? Well, I was just looking for somewhere in Florida, and um, you know, I, I I was married at the time, and my wife kind of liked this area better than Tampa or Orlando, um, and going like Miami, Miami, Fort Lauderdale was like more you know crowded so we just kind of ended up here by you know by fluke almost and what did you retire from Um, i ran a company that did uh, financial services for college students oh wow highly needed my we're talking uh in a previous episode with paulie that my son's mother was a um a professor a professor college professor made a lot of money and ended up paying a great deal of that back in student loans with interest she could never have the type of life that she deserved what would you tell a college kid today about uh about loans, student loans? Well, I haven't been in the business for many, many years, so I'm not up to date on everything. But, um, you know, I think at this point, there's a 
more of a question of whether or not college is even worth it. The, the expenses are so crazy. Um, as far as loans, um, there there are some loans that are interest free, like the, the Stafford loan. Um, I assume it's still interest free. So um, if you're offering an interest free loan, that's a good thing. Uh, so even if you have the money, you can pay it back later and you don't have to pay any interest on it. Okay. And we're, I know we're talking to you today about the history of fantasy sports and the stories of the people who made it happen, your new book. But this is kind of a follow-up from your, your other book, right? This is actually a follow-up from the winning fantasy baseball, the secret strategies of next time national champion, right? Um, no, not at all. In 2014, I wrote winning fantasy baseball, which is all about my strategy for how to win fantasy baseball. And a lot of it applies to other sports like fantasy football, fantasy basketball, whatever. The book that I just released a few months ago has absolutely nothing to do with that. Oh, I uh, figured it was a follow-up. People wanted more. No, 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 no. Winning fantasy baseball is my strategy on how to win fantasy baseball from, you know, from everything, you know, from how to project players and draft players and in-season management, the whole thing. This has got nothing to do with it. This is the history of fantasy sports. It's not about me, not about my opinions. It's about how did we go from some ideas people had years ago for games to where we are now, where you have millions and millions of people all over the world playing not only fantasy football, fantasy baseball, but you've got fantasy I did a ride, mm -hmm. fantasy snowboarding. I mean, it's fantasy you gave everything. It, they've got it. Yeah. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry with stat services and news services and analysts. And, you know, every time, you know, now when you watch a game on TV, it has all the fantasy information. So, you know, nobody has ever done this before. Nobody really even knew exactly what happened, how we got from that to where we are today. So I kind of thought for several years, somebody should write a book like this. And so I decided to do it. When I started it, the idea was I'm going to write a book called The History of Fantasy Sports and tell, you know, how we got from there to here. As I started to research and talk to people, I learned fascinating information about what various people had done. And I realized that I could just kind of write the facts and figures and who did what when, and it would tell the whole story, but it would also come off like a very boring research paper. But the information I learned about people was fascinating. So that's where I got the subtitle of the book, which is in the stories of the people who made it happen. So I'm telling what happened and who did what and when, but I'm also telling people stories which have made the book really easy to read and interesting. You know, the reviews are fantastic. People are saying it's an easy read. It's fascinating. Uh, the stories are, and some of them are inspirational. Some of them are humorous. Some of them even bring a tear to your eye. So that's what this book is about. So, so tell us where fantasy sports started. Well, there are precursors to fantasy sports like tabletop games. And then you had like Hatico, Ellis, all-star baseball board game. You had Stratomatic and Appa. The difference with the precursors is those were based on games that had already happened. Like, on uh, you know professional like major league baseball for example but the prior year statistics right whereas the fancy fancy sports that you know we play now primarily that my book is talking about are where you're you're drafting teams but you don't know what their performance is yet so like before the nfl season you draft the fancy football team and then you wait and see what happens over the course of the year but you're still picking players from whatever era, right? But you just, these teams have never performed. Therefore, you can't get averages and stats from them because they haven't done anything yet. Well, no, you're, you're not picking from any era. You're picking from the current season. You're current. Okay. From the current season. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like for the, you know, for fantasy football this year, you know, um, up until a couple of weeks ago, people were drafting their fantasy football teams full of players that are on rosters this year and going to play this year. So, you're going to get their statistics for this year and you, you can kind of predict what you think is going to happen based on their past performance. Um, but you never know for sure. Like this last weekend in football, a whole bunch of guys got injured, you know, several, several star players got injured. So uh, whoever took them in fantasy football, you know, that's not 
not a good result for them. Well, yeah. So then, like you said, you could take their past performances, like even if they're rookies, you know, from their, you know, their pre pro bowl, pre pro, pre pro uh, enrollment is that you can actually, when they were rookies, you're getting, you're getting their college stats or whatever. Right. And so that's interesting. What about, so everything comes into play. I know that we just, uh, one of our 49ers, then one of the new draft picks got shot. And he's mm-hmm. on the injured, and he's going to be coming back and making some crazy comeback, a record comeback as far as getting shot in the chest and being able to play football again. Mm-hmm. And so you guys take it when you're when they look at this, they look at everything, huh? Well, the the college statistics don't count for this. You're trying to project what people are going to do this year. So if a you know if a player was in college last year and now he's on a team in the in the pros you're just trying to predict based on whatever you know about it what the person is going to do this year okay uh, yeah and the guy that got shot um yeah when you know i don't um i think his name is pearsall i think yeah Pierce yeah Saul. yeah yeah he i i'm not sure offhand i don't think he was necessarily expected to do a lot this year although i'm not sure about that but you know let's let's just say hypothetically if he was expected to do a lot and you had your fantasy football draft before he got shot um you know you somebody took him at a you know decent pick and then he got shot well you know it's too bad now you don't get to use him for four weeks well here's here's my thought and in this (laughs) and again i don't know i guess you look at everything but it's like wow that guy just got shot he definitely got trauma and injured and he's probably not going to be running as hard as he was. I bet you he's going to be doing even better, man. This it, 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 not even a bullet could stop that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, it's well, going to take a the, couple hits to bring that well, guy the in. Bullet, you know, the bullet hit him in the right place, you know. Yeah, it, very it, lucky. You know, yeah, definitely yeah, played the lottery. Yeah. yeah, now, you know, now somebody getting shot, obviously that's very unusual, but, you know, this, this sort of thing is totally common when people, people – you know, they strain a calf muscle, they have, you know, some other injury. And so, you know, they're going to be out for two weeks or they're going to be out for six weeks or however long. And then you, you know, there's a question of, okay, when they come back, you know, are they going to be at a hundred percent or are they going to be less than a hundred percent or are they, are they going to be at a risk of re-injury? So all these things come into play with fantasy football and fantasy baseball and, you know, every, every, every fantasy sport. And, and injuries are a big part of it. You know, my my book, my book covers the whole thing from precursors to fantasy sports, then how fantasy baseball was invented and spread, how fantasy football was Larry, invented. Larry, let, let me interrupt you for a second. I'm interested in that panel, that that first panel of baseball roto guys. Are they, are they mentioned in your book? Sure. That's what I just said that, you know, the, the creation and spread of fantasy baseball. Um, no, specifically, specifically. Yeah, that includes, that includes, that includes, I, I assume you're talking about Dan O'Krint and right. And his, yeah. Tell yeah. me something uh, about them that um, stood out in your mind. Well, Dan O'Krint is the guy who is primarily credited with inventing fantasy baseball. And there's a kind of a, a legend that he magically thought of the idea on a plane ride from Connecticut to Texas. And that is not true. There's a whole lot more to the story. There are also people who played primitive games of, of fantasy before his invention. Um, but he, you know, he gets the lion's share of credit for creating the modern game. And it, as you mentioned, I think you mentioned before, um, it, it was originally called Rook History Baseball or Rota Baseball for short. The reason is when Okrent met with some of his friends to kind of finalize the rules and, and the league, they met at a Manhattan restaurant called La Rotisserie Francaise. And so they named it after that restaurant. And they also, a little bit later on, they trademarked the name, thinking they might be able to make some money off the game. But what happened is um, people would realize that they didn't really have anything that they could protect other than trademarking the name rotisserie baseball. So some people just took the, took the game for their own purposes and sh- simply changed the name from rotisserie baseball to fantasy baseball. 
so that's where the term fantasy baseball came in. It was just people using that term so they didn't have to pay some kind of uh, you know trademark fee to to uh, Okra and his guys. Okay. Uh, did they go on to anything else of note? Well, Okrent, for example, he had he's had a very illustrious career as a writer. You know, he he's written some books that have won awards. He was um, the first I think he was the first public editor for the New York Times. I mean, the guy the guy's had this illustrious career as a as a writer and journalist. And, you know, it actually kind of pisses him off somewhat that he's, he's remembered so much, you know, for fantasy baseball when he's had this illustrious career otherwise. I, I've read about him and um, I'm sure that has to be frustrating. It's like playing a role on a sitcom and then you'll remember just for that role as opposed to anything you do pales by comparison he's been typecast huh okay got you okay how about yourself what's your next project um my 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 current project is just promoting the book and getting the word out about the book um and i'll be doing that for the foreseeable future this this is one of the biggest accomplishments of my life there's never been a book like this there's never going to be another book like this and it's needed uh, it was needed so um i'm just trying to get the word out anybody that likes fantasy sports will love the book if you know somebody that likes fantasy sports it's a great gift to give somebody um it's available on amazon and most major booksellers uh web um, ebook and paperback um, amazon has a lot of details and reviews about it and um yeah, so I'm, you know, I have no plans for anything further. Okay. Uh, what do you do for fun besides all of this? I tried to get to it. Um, what makes you happy on a day-to-day -day basis besides this, which seems to be your passion at the moment? Well, I'm still playing fantasy football and fantasy baseball. I'm still playing golf. Um, you know, those are my main hobbies. Okay. You know. How do you express yourself other than through written word? You said you played piano when you were younger. Yeah, when I was younger, and since since then, I since then I just play a little bit once in a while if there happens to be a piano somewhere. I did stand up comedy for about six years or so, but I'm retired from that. What made you do stand up? Did, what did you think was funny in other people? Who did you listen to? Was it Cosby, um, George Burns? Who influenced you? Um, I I wouldn't say anybody influenced me, but I have several that I like. You know, um, sign just off the top of my head, Seinfeld. I mean, Robin Williams, Stephen Wright. I mean, there, there's several. You know, there's several good comedians, but no one really influenced me. I just it's it's something that I kind of had always thought of doing and I got to a point in my life where I had a lot of free time and um, decided to do it. Maybe more inspired than influenced. Yeah. Cause Robin Williams, I mean, I, just because I have some sort of ties and we're here in the Bay area and, and, and stuff. And I was just, I was just in Robin Williams meadow two days ago uh, performing. And yeah. so uh, it it kind of does you you feel some sort of connection it, it, there is that there and so it's a it's a great art form so have you thought about doing that again um i've thought about it but i don't think i will probably do it again okay yeah. um if you hadn't moved to florida where would you have moved to I have no idea. But Eddie, you could be anywhere in the world. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna give you we're gonna give you free license. I'll, right. I'll pick, and, I'll, and I'll, pick Ari, I'll pick Arizona. Okay. So you wanted Another, to go somewhere warm because you were from upstate warm. New York. Yeah, it's warm, warm, and golf. We'll go there. <laughs> okay. Just give me some warm and a patch of green, and we're fine. Yeah. 
All right, cool. Um, so you're not going to talk actually, about your right, next product. Right, actually, right now, right now, I would actually pick any state that is very blue or very red. So there would be less political commercials. Wow. Yeah, right, that's not right, this right country now, at all. Right now, I don't know if I can stand another 50 days of these constant political commercials every two seconds. Well, you have to realize this election means a, an awful lot. If you had to choose one of the candidates, who would it be? Oh, you're going to ask him that question? He, we're from the generation. That is just rude to ask. You might as well uh, ask a lady how much she weighs or how old she is. Well, how old is that big old? I am not, yeah, I am not, I am not answering that question. Good. Think, Smart you know, man. And I think, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think these celebrities and, you know, all these celebrities that, you know, talk about politics and who they're for, you know, I think that's a big mistake because you're just going to piss off half of your fans. You're going to divide the room no matter what happens. So they say as a comedian, you don't want to divide the room. You want to unite the room. And so when you go in and you start bashing one candidate or the other, you lose 30 to 60%, depending on who you're bashing or whatever. And sure. So yeah. You might as well play it safe. But that's one thing you don't do is play it safe. That's right. It's the history of fantasy sports, uh, the stories and the stories of the people who made it happen available on Amazon. Give us that shameless plug one more time before we let you go. It's on Amazon, um, paperback and Kindle. And that's also where you can see more details about what's in the book and reviews. It's also on most major booksellers, websites, um, ebook and paperback. And you still have the winning fantasy baseball book out there. So, and you can get that at all those links also. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you very much for your time today. We've had a blast. I have had more fun than I'm entitled to have. <laughs> yeah, your little ankle bracelet just kind of hummed and beeped a little Ooh. bit. So go to watch out. Uh, thank th you, Larry. Thank this you, Larry. Any great. other last minute shout outs to anybody or anything? Larry? Uh, no, I just encourage people, um, you know, get the book. If you like fantasy sports, you're going to love it. Even people who don't play fantasy sports have loved the book because there's so many interesting stories about the entrepreneurs that created an industry. I mean, it's just like one story after another, which I didn't even really get to get into today. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can't get it right now, just put it on your wish list for your birthday or Christmas. Hey, you know, I feel like I cut you short by, by that express, by that saying, give me one of your stories before we let you go that, um, would make you happy because the audience would be enriched and and also you know you always want to leave them wanting more larry so give us a little teaser from the book and and let's see if we can get some of those sales in for you right well frankly there are like dozens of different stories i'll just give you one one little one that comes to mind um this is certain you know just one of the one of the very because I the book covers like everything because the first news services websites magazines and like everything through you know more modern like daily fantasy sports, but one of the first stat services was run by a married couple Jim and Gloria Berger, and what they had to do is back then you would get the stats from the USA Today on Tuesdays and Wednesdays they had the AL on Tuesday and the NL on Wednesday. So they'd get all the stats from there and put them into their computer and then they could run their statistics reports. And one day on a, on a Wednesday, Gloria went into labor with her first child and they didn't let a little thing like going into labor prevent them from getting the statistics out. So in between her con contractions, Gloria would read the statistics from the USA Today and Jim would put them in the computer. And when she felt another contraction coming on, she'd be like, oh, wait, 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 hold on. Okay, mm -hmm. it's gone, and then she should continue. And so they got the report out on time that day. And then now, 37 years later, their daughter that was born that day plays with her dad in a fantasy football league. Wow. Wow. That's cool. That really is cool. That yeah, humanizes you your entire, humanizes, that's the type of thing that humanizes your entire book. Because as you say, you're dealing with lives and people and multi-generational not, not just numbers exactly yeah um, i highly recommend it can't wait to get it and um 
We enjoyed having you, Larry. Yeah, will you come back and join us again? And and I, this time we I, we promise we won't be late. I certainly will. All right, you guys. Okay. Uh, thank you, Larry, for joining us. Uh, stay warm down there in Florida. I'll try. It's only you know it's a cool ninety two right now or something. Wow. Yeah, but it's a hundred in Arizona, so you made the right choice. <laughs> I'm yeah. serious. It's been a like a hundred for days on end. Uh, but there's no climate change. It's all a big myth. It's the press who feeds you that crap. Larry, we loved having you. Thank you again. All right, guys. And make sure you check out the history of fantasy sports and the stories of the people who made it happen. Uh, for myself, Ralph Zig Tycho. We're out, right? We are, Paulie B. All right. We'll see you next week in the zone, folks. Until next time.